So, welcome everybody. Um, hope you're all having a good conference. Yes? No? Well, that could change. Um, <laughs> welcome to this uh, session on going from an API to a usable module. Um, talking to people around the conference, um, my idea of usable is kind of a bit of an opinion and we'll, we'll talk a bit, of, or I'll talk a bit about that. Um, but this is a kind of case study of what I've been doing over recent months. I've been working with Octopus Deploy and I've found that one way to learn Octopus was actually to start writing a module calling its REST API. Uh, my contact details are up there. Um, the QR code is for my blog. You'll also find me uh, as JH O'Neill um, around GitHub. I'm James O'Neill on Twitter. Um, if, you, uh, if you want some really opinionated stuff on Formula One, yeah, sign up to my Twitter feed. My background, I was at Microsoft when PowerShell launched. Uh, I've gone and done a couple of other interesting things since, um, including working for a Formula One team, which is where the opinions come from. And um, I now work freelance. Um, Mobular Consulting is the name of the, um, the organisation that I work freelance under. Um, Mobula, for those people who aren't into uh, fish, is a very large array, a bit like a manta. Um, so, this session, um, I'm going to go into a few basics, um, how we get started with an API, and then what do I think a good module looks like, and then start to drill into what I actually did with Octopus Deploy. So, some of the structure, uh, some of the stuff about keeping APIs, API keys safe, and then some of the design things about how different bits feed together. So, some quick basics on uh, REST APIs. Um, I, we, t we kind of take REST APIs for granted a lot these days, um, but to get everybody on the same page, typically we're sending a GET request if we want to read information, so it's going to some host and some string of parameters, and we get an object back, or we get multiple objects back. It's the object comes back, obviously, in, in some sort of serialized text form. Usually that's JSON, but it could be any format. Um, and if there are a lot of objects coming back, they're usually paged in some way. And one of the things that we have to do is to figure out, if we're getting multiple objects, do we have to get multiple pages and, and so on. To add, uh, update, or delete objects, we call other HTTP methods. Again, if we're deleting something, usually we just send an idea of what we want to delete. If we're updating or adding something, we're normally sending a JSON body to say, this is what we would like to have once we're done. Um, REST, everything is self-contained. We don't have any concept of an ongoing session. So I was talking about paging a second ago. Um, there's no idea of, of going, going back to the server and say, I, I was here a second ago, can I have the next page, please? You basically go back and you say, I would like the same request, but can you start from item number 51, if it sent you 50 the first time. So the, there is no enduring state, and yet we have to log on. So typically, we'll send a header that's got some authentication information in it, and we'll, we'll see that a bit more in a minute. So self-contained requests. The URIs typically look something like this, so there'll be HTTP or HTTPS, and either you get a tenant-specific URL, so it says my host at something or other, dot something or other, or there will be one generic host name, and then the tenant's identified somewhere in the parameters and the, and the um, URI path. The something part... Um, Commonly with these APIs, they will say what type of object we're going we're to request. And if you just request the object type on its own, common behavior is to give you every one of those objects. Um, then we specify some parameters. So we might have a filter parameter, or we might put the ID. And this will vary depending on the particular API we're calling. In some cases, you find that you, you request an object ID, and then you say, okay, this object, ID, this object has descendants. So you might say, get me the um, 
try and think. Oh, brain's gone blank for an example. Um, but get me, for example, this um, octopus project, then get me the steps in the project and the actions in those steps, and you build up a hierarchy in the, in the, um, your, in the URI that way. Um, one of the APIs I worked with um, prior to doing this was the one for Azure DevOps. And DevOps does this to an enormous degree. So if you say, I want to change the form that I use for a particular kind of work item, you can be about seven or eight layers deep down, down, this, uh, down that chain in the URI. So I mentioned authentication. Sometimes the, 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 um, the authentication is quite short term. So something like Graph, for example, if you're talking to the Graph API, you do an OAuth style authentication. You get a token that's valid for minutes or hours, but it's not valid for sort of ever. Alternatively, you get a personal access token or an API key. They go by different names. But typically, those are valid for a lot longer. Sometimes they're valid indefinitely, but they're valid for sort of months or years. <laughs> Either way, we're going to send that with every request, and we need to treat those with a little bit of care because effectively, they're as good as a username and password. They've, they've logged us on as that user. And the other headers that we, we send vary from API to API. So one API will be fairly consistent within itself. So the example I put up on there, one API will say, oh yeah, you don't have to say that you're sending me JSON. I understand everything's going to be JSON. Another one will say, no, you've absolutely got to tell me that this is JSON, even though you never, ever send me anything else. And you just ex figure out what the API you're working with expects, and you just repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. So, how do we get started with an API? This came up about three weeks ago for me. Um, I got asked by the people where I'm contracting at the moment, um, can we start automating the creation of apps in Okta using Terraform? And I sat there and went, uh, I guess so. Uh, uh, let, let's kind of walk, walk our way through it. So what we do is they give me an API key. I write a bit of stuff that Terraform processes. Uh, the Terraform provider does its magic. I don't know what goes on in the Okta Terraform provider. I don't need to know. I just write the little bit of HCL. Magic happens. And I'm sitting there going, I wonder if I can see this from PowerShell. I've got an API key. It looks like a REST API. I'll pop onto Okta's developer site and a couple of clicks on Okta's developer site, I get to some information. And drilling into that information, because that's way too small to read, they give me a little snippet of curl. Now, I don't speak curl, but I can recognize some things I need to know in this curl, okay? Which is, it's a get request, I'm sending an authorization header, and the authorization header goes SSWS and my token. Well, I've, I've got the token. I don't know what SSWS means. I don't need to know. I just put that in front of my, my token. And where I'm going, and then this is quite a common pattern as well. Although I said in, the, in, in one of the earlier slides that uh, you frequently see just API and then the, the, the object class, it's, it's probably more common than not to have a version sneaked in there as well. Octopus doesn't do that, but quite a few of the other things I've, I've worked with do. So I can turn that into an in, um, invoke rest method command in PowerShell. That's really easy. Uh, no, that's not the real developer address, by the way. Um, that comes up on the next slide. Um, but I can, I can do invoke rest method. And so this worked first time. Couldn't believe it. Absolutely couldn't believe it. So off it went. Went and found my, uh, my app that I'd created in Okta. And one thing, I uh, they said don't point at the screen. Um, down at the bottom there, you can see there's underscore links. This we'll see when we get to the, the octopus stuff. But quite often, what gets returned gives you links to get to other helpful stuff. 
So that, that was looking quite good. And I blurred it out there, but there's an ID in there. So if I try going to apps slash ID, again, I get some information back. That's got links, and I can link to users of the app. Brilliant. I'm actu I've, I've actually cracked calling the Okta REST API. Brilliant. Well, forget Octopus. I'll, I'll, go, and, I'll go and write an Okta module next. Um, and this is where I need to bring some caution in. There's a difference between an API call and a user command. Okay? A user is thinking, I want to be able to do these things with these objects. Typically, the, the, the CRUD operations. I want to create, read, update, delete them. I expect it to give me something that, as a human being, I can read on screen. Um, hopefully, nice output that maybe I can pipe into something else. Um, I do a lot of stuff that involves sending this stuff to Excel, but um, you might use it somewhere else. And I expect it to be kind of PowerShell-y. You know, if I go delete environment in Octopus, I expect PowerShell to come back and say, are you really absolutely sure you want to do this? Okay. And the module is kind of providing some intelligence between me and the API. Okay, so that layer between the user interface and the programming interface, where the, where the program itself sits, is supposed to provide some intelligence wiring this lot up. Now, PowerShell is going to help with a lot of this because it means I don't have to code understanding JSON. I just go invoke web request. Some JSON, JSON comes over the wire. It becomes a PowerShell object. Great. PowerShell will help me with the formatting, and we're going to see quite a lot of that as we go on, but I need some intelligence and there are tools out there that will turn an API into another API. Okay, We call it command line, but basically all it's doing is it's translating JSON calls into things that you type. Okay, That's not the goal here. The API is just going to do what it's told. The API description doesn't say things like, you ought to be tab completing this parameter. You ought to be asking before you perform this operation. Um, those kinds of things. So we're not trying to move from um, an API of REST calls to an API of typing. And to try and illustrate the gap that we're trying to bridge, we get JSON back by making an API call. So it might be successes and failures and dates. Sometimes we want to know the distribution by month of, th of that. But the user probably just wants to know what proportion of success and failure I had. Okay, that's the gap we're trying to bridge. So how do we make a good module as defined by James? Well, the first thing is, um, I think it's properly called the Pareto Principle. 80% of the tasks will only use 20% of the API. So go find that 20% and put your effort in there. All right? A few good commands to do the 80% of the work beats 100% coverage with rotten commands. Yeah? Every time. And grow little by little. You know, the, there's a thing about the best way of eating an elephant is one mouthful at a time. Um, and don't try and take the whole thing on. So I'll, I'll come back to grow, grow organically on the next point. But if you produce something and it's good, then other people will come along and say, it's great so as far as it's gone, but could you just add this bit? And that will, might tell you the extra little bit of the API that you need to cover rather than trying to fill in the 100%. And growing organically, we, we saw it in the, the earlier slide. We can go and make calls to get information really easily. Set is not too difficult because we can see what we got back and then we just change it and send it back again. Adding new items is probably the most difficult of the lot because we're, we're starting from a clean sheet of paper. So work up, re do read stuff first and then start modifying, adding and so on. And that way you've learnt a lot of stuff before you change anything and hopefully you've made your mistakes reading before you actually uh, 
write anything to your production environment. And users care about input and output. Uh, they, don't, they don't really care what's in the middle. So well-written parameters, nice formatting. People who maintain stuff, they care about code quality, clarity, consistency. And think of yourself as a future maintainer. Get future you to thank current you for the quality of code you wrote. The number of times I've gone back to something and gone either, what idiot wrote this? Oh, it was me. Or, hey, when I wrote that, I was smart enough to fill in the blank. All right? And I don't know which, which comes up more often, but the number of times I go back to code and I don't remember writing it, it gets, as I get older, it gets kind of frightening. And, and, and you go back, so write it to be clear. Nobody except the person writing it cares how smart you were inside. So, the case study part then. This is a piece of the, of the real Octopus website. I've, I've, I've only doctored it slightly for slide purposes. But you can see on there, there is something that kind of says, this is how we're going to call Octopus. So you can see there's a URL, we've got an API key. And where previously the authentication header said SSWS, whatever it was, this one says X Octopus API key. And then the, the API key, well, good, OK, we can understand that. So I went from this on Octopus's website, and preparing the slide deck, I said, well, show me how many commands there are in my module now. I got to that many commands. No, I don't know how I got from one to the other either. It just grew. So, I'm not going to be able to explain much about what I did without a little bit of Octopus explanation. Is, is anybody here using Octopus Deploy? Right, it's about two or three. So, I quite like Octopus Deploy. I don't work for Octopus, um, and I did, this isn't an Octopus Deploy session. Okay, but this will only make sense if I explain a few of the terms. Octopus's job, it's a product to deploy software into different environments. So, for example, I've got a production environment and a test environment, and each of those environments has got a web server and a database server. I've got a database package and an application package, and those have to go to the appropriate servers. Okay, not an uncommon scenario. In Octopus terms, I define a project and the project has a set of process steps. And the process steps basically say, put the database package on the database servers, the, web pack the app package on the web servers, and you can do this in, of all the environments we've got def def defined here, you can do it in test and production. So we have that concept of a project. So we've already, I've already introduced packages, projects, processes, and environments. And when I go to do a deployment, I create a release. And a release says, use these steps that are currently defined in the project to deploy these versions of the packages into these environments. And it creates a task for each environment to roll those out. So that's basically what Octopus does. And as a user, I want to do things like this. I want to see what environments I've got. I want to see what projects exist, whether they're turned on or off, whether they've had releases made for them, whether those releases were successful, what versions of the packages each one pu pushed out, and so on. So one of the things I run on a sort of every few days basis is a report that just says, of all the projects that this organization has, and there are about 60 of them, and they go into five different environments. It's a little bit more complicated than that because some of them have got extra environments, but basically it's a matrix of 60 projects by five environments. Um, what version of the packages went into each? Uh, it's current, it was the most, recent, most recently deployed into each environment. And one of the critical things is when the tasks ran, did they work or succeed? There's lots of other stuff, but we've only got 40 minutes to, to look at it. 
Who was in the last session over the way on um, Crescendo? Okay. So one of the things from Crescendo was you saw things came back as PS custom objects, yeah? When the stuff got parsed. Well, that's exactly what goes on in um, invoke rest method. You get back a PS custom object. So the smart thing to do is to say, I got back a PS custom object from something, and I know that that returns, in Octopus's case, environments or projects or tasks. So I'm going to tag that using PS type names, and then I can format that object in whatever way I like, and I can extend that object by saying, I know that an environment has these additional methods. So that idea of call an API, get a PS custom object back, and then do stuff from types and formats is one to kind of um, use in other places, not just with REST APIs. And one of the things that comes up is that all the get operations particularly are very, very similar. So it has to decide, are you, are you asking for something by ID or are you asking for me to search by name? It's got to assemble the URL, assemble the header, put all the web request stuff together, send it off, get the responses back. If it's a multi-part response, expand that, figure out paging, whatever it needs to do, and then set the type of each of the objects. And I ended up putting all the common bits into one function called invoke octopus method. And I think that's enough slides for the moment. Let's go and have a look at what all this looks like. So, uh, this is a machine running in Azure. Um, it's got Octopus Deploy running on it. Uh, it's got a little um, uh, developer license that lets me run a, a, a small amount of stuff on it. And here I've got just Visual Studio Code and I've downloaded onto here the module. So the first thing I'm just going to do is import the module. And what should happen, all being well, is it should say I've got a connection and I've logged on as James. I'm just going to check how we are for size on the screen. Is that just about legible for people? Good, OK. So the way it did that, um, if I just show you, I've got this XML file here. Uh, in here, we've got the username is actually the name of the server. And the password is a secure string. I just get you to note that that ends 477FF. Okay, that's my password in secure form. I quite commonly put things in a credential object and export them with export cli XML. If I come over here, um, I've got that same uh, file, so ending 4777F, and if I go import cli XML of that, it basically says, you're not the same user who exported it, it's not the same machine, I cannot find the key that was used to, to create that secure string. So that's reasonably secure as, as far as I'm concerned. So I'm quite happy to leave my API key in there. In actual fact, we'll see in a second, my API key is now in an environment variable as well. So um, I'm going to skip those next couple. And I can do invoke rest method. So if I just do an invoke rest method without specifying the uh, a header. You can see it just comes back and says, you haven't identified yourself. What are, you, what are you doing asking for a list of environments? But if I create an authentication header, so this is just like that little screenshot I showed from the Octopus website, back comes a list 
Um, this is this is paged, and you can see that it says uh, the item type was environment. We got three results, ten to a page, so we only need to send you one page, and the last page number is page number zero. Down here, you can see here's actually the information to request the next page, the last page, all, all possible items and so on. So I've got that information in here. The list of environments that I've got is in that items section there. So I could do that again and drill into the links, but I've shown you the links. So, oh no, the thing I wanted to do was to show you um, tasks, because I've got rather more tasks. So if I do the same thing with tasks, what you see up here is there are 104 results. Tasks come back at 30 to a page, so there were four pages, and I'm on page zero, um, and I have pages one, two, and three. And down here, you can see, again, links to get the uh, extra information. Now, I can get an individual item. So we saw in, when I got environments, there was a collection of items there, but I can just specify the URL for one item. So you can see environments one, it's called dev, and again, it's got some links to get other information about it. And if I scroll down a bit further on my list of pre-prepared things to call, if I call that again, but this time just add octopus environment to PS type names, you'll see that it changes how that's rendered. It's picked up that there's a particular way to format that. So I created this uh, invoke octopus method. So if I just said go to environments, that's like one of the earlier calls I made. It just gets the information back. If I say expand the items, so this is going to give you, I know this URL will give me a list, so expand the items, I get my three different environments in not a very user-friendly kind of format. And then if I say, and those are going to be of type octopus environment, they're actually nicely formatted. So that's how I get to the formatting. And... An environment contains machines, so if I just do invoke uh, octopus method and get my environments and put them in a variable, if I do get member, what you'll see is there are some script methods for that. So I've got the machines that are in the environment as a script method. So here's environment zero. That's environment number one. If I show you the script, it just says, if you can see at the bottom there, invoke octopus method. This is going to return machines. And the links, we need to do a little bit of processing because to be helpful, uh, e.0.links. What it's said here is that machine's URL can take skip, take, partial name, etc. as parameters. Well, I don't want that when I call this. So here we've just said get rid of everything after that open brace. So that's thrown away everything after the open brace. So we're just going to call API spaces one, environments, environments one, machines. So if I run that, 
surprise, surprise, we get machines back. And there's only one machine in there. So that is uh, a little bit of how that works. Um, one little thing, tab complete in get octopus environment. Oh yes, get octopus environment. So one of the things that I, I coded in here was to say, if one of the objects returned has got one of those script properties on it, make it accessible from the command that's getting the object. So here in get octopus environment, if I just go for tab completion, you'll notice that it's tabbing around the different environments. Okay, this is one of the things that I was talking about that users think is important. Somebody shouts stop. Okay, and I'll do minus machine. And the great thing is, I've only got one machine and it's in all the environments, so I'm going to get the same result regardless. But I can select my environment via tab completion, okay? And this turns out to be quite easy to do because the API is nice and consistent. So, one other thing that was consistent, you notice I had the command get octopus environment. I can, I've also got get octopus machine. So I can go tab and I've only got the one machine but it's called localhost. But I can also do get octopus, flying by the seat of my pants here, and make machine a parameter because all the commands are so similar that actually I can, I can get all the different types with one command. So in a lot of cases, these specific commands are wrappers for this general command which then calls invoke octopus method. So back to the slides. Um, I mentioned, but I, uh, I, I just reiterate what I said before, the API key logs on as a user. So you, you need to treat the API key with a little bit of respect. Um, a lot of CI CD pipelines like to put uh, the username and password and other secrets into environment variables. And I've got in the habit of doing that. I'm not convinced it's the best of habits. But at the moment, I'm, I'm doing stuff with environment. And some of the, the early samples I picked up were setting the environment key and the URL as environment variables. So that's what I did. And then I added this function, connect octopus, that would pick those up as parameters or from a credential object. And I was showing you the credential object before. And connect will report the connection status. So it tells me where it's connected and who it connected as. So the module looks in the PowerShell profile directory for an XML file and, and processes that. And that was what we saw when I, when I first, started logging, first started that session. So the first commands I created, um, I'm not a huge fan of prefixing um, the noun in a verb noun name with something else. But more or less the first thing I worked with was an ambiguous name. Lots of things work with projects. Octopus Deploy works with projects, so I was going to have to call them Get Octopus Whatever. Um, so the first thing that I created was, was Get Octopus Project, and you can see there I've got some formatting, so I've got a, 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 a formatted as a table with a header. Um, Octopus likes to have um, groups to put the different projects in, so I show which groups things are in. And... Um, the IDs are staggeringly consistent. So you, you, you can see on that one, they're called projects and a number. For environments, they're environments and a number. And basically, the same name appears in the, um, uh, as the, the object type in the, in the URI that we send, uh, and, then you, and then also in the, in the key. So it becomes very easy to, to know when you're looking at a key and what it's a key for. Um, and that made life really easy. I'm, again, I'm not sure how legible this is, but there's a, I, I created a command to help with the formatting. 
um, when you saw the machines, that machine that said it was in multiple environments, what was returned was the three IDs, but it actually displayed the three names because um, connect, uh, convert octopus ID can just say, you've given me an ID that's projects and a number. This must be for a project. So I'll go ask for the project with the ID um, projects one. And it comes back and it says that's the project called random quotes. And search by name in Octopus is remarkably consistent, which meant that that get Octopus command that I was showing you, um, that actually works and we can just give it a name or an ID and it figures out what, it, what it's supposed to be doing. So that was easy. The links were easy, but the links threw up another question. And you've seen part of my answer to that question, but let's kind of drill into that a little bit. Objects are descended from each other. So if I want to get the releases for a project, I can think of at least three different syntaxes for doing that. So do I get the project and pipe it into something that takes a project and gets a release? Do I um, get the project object and then call a, um, a method on it? Or do I make that part of getting the project? And the answer is all three. I am a great believer in users being able to use whichever way works for them at the time. And I find that I use all three of these. I'm, I'm quite glad that I coded them, all, coded them all up. Again, the nature of this particular API it made that easier than some others that I've worked with. Um, so the links become part of the object. So you saw me do this with machines for environments, but we get the same thing for uh, projects. Now, in the case of projects, I know I shouldn't be doing this, but... Just here, you can see it does take a parameter, so we can say, get the first 100 releases, or the first, it defaults to 100, we can get whatever other number we like. And then it's just a question of calling the, um, the URI that's in links and saying what it is that we, we want to get. And then for each one of those, I modified the command that gets that kind of object to say, and if the re you've specified a releases switch, at the end of the process, call the releases method on all the objects you've got. Okay. Now, this gets kind of, well, I, I'm not sh I don't want to call it clever as such, but I get the object, I don't do any work to say, in, in the code, to say, this object has a releases method. That's all done in the, in the types XML file. Um, which brings me neatly to types and formats. So that previous one, evoke octopus method, expand items says it's a list, PS type says it's going to be a release, and then the endpoint is either the complete API or just enough of it that we can make sense of it and when that comes back and says it's an octopus release um, the types file says that gets extra methods and the formats file defines how that should look and we just have to repeat that for all the different types so let me hop back to my screen here and just show you what that looks like. So we were looking at machines before. Oh, I'll try and do that properly this time. That's better. Jeffrey talked about living like Osama bin Laden for three years, and I am a little bit out of practice with the, um, the AV skills. Right. Um, so here's the types information for a machine. Okay. So we've defined, for, for machines, I've actually defined a default property set. So default property set says if you've got no other formatting information to go on, 
just displayed these properties, um, that turns out to save a, save a lot of other aggravation writing properties. And then here, we've got tasks, and tasks is a, is a one-line script method. So if I actually go back to the last command I ran, uh, machine local host, so that should be a machine, and if I say get its tasks, those are the tasks that run on that machine. Again, all nicely formatted. So that's just come from defining that in the, in the types information, and I don't need to have the um, default members property set. I can just have these script methods. So this one's got two. Some, of it, some have only got one. Some have got quite a lot. And then the formatting, I think I've got this open at machine. It just says there's a view called machine. It's selected by the type of machine. And then we've got a description of what a table looks like. Now, writing this stuff, the, writing the first few is a bit, of a bit of a grind. And then you just get in a rhythm of copy-paste, 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 and it, it gets easier. Um, I also find that when I want to, to go and look for something as, a, as an example, I go back to um, Windows PowerShell 5, where the information is still available as... Um, a human readable XML file rather than being embedded in the in the actual PowerShell DLLs. So that's types and formats. As I say, it, it the first few are, are are quite hard work, and then then they then they just become a a kind of crank the handle job, and you produce more and more of them. So parameter completers uh, the this one makes this module makes really heavy use of parameter completers, and the, the API is so similar from uh, one task to another that uh, we we're able to just reuse the same completer for each one. So there's a generic. I've created this generic completer again. Sorry for pointing at the screen, but that generic completer says I can see I'm a completer for a project parameter. Therefore, I'm going to go and query projects. So most of that's been about gets. Um, updating and completing, generally it's a pretty easy process. Uh, we get the object, we change a property, we send it back again. And Octopus's API is really tolerant of junk in the JSON. If there's anything that's not part of the JSON schema, it just ignores it, which means that you can take all kinds of liberties with the JSON that you can't. If anyone's ever tried to do this with something like ARM templates, ARM is really picky about stuff that shouldn't be there. Um, this, this one, you just, you just send it back, and it goes, oh, that's nothing to do with me. I'll ignore that piece. Um, so that's what I mean by tolerant. So up here, um, I realize I'm going to run out of time shortly, but you can see here I've got my three environments, and I think I've still got... Oops, let's not update that. Uh, e zero. Oh, I haven't exited from the. Thank you for that. I'd have been I'd have been carrying on with the with the still thinking it was in PowerPoint indefinitely. There we go. So up here. Uh, I was looking at E0. So E0 was that uh, environment dev. You can see it's got no description. But I can literally just say, set the description. And that, ob oops, let's set it to... Um, 
that object has got all the links in it to say how it should be updated. It's got a link for itself. So I can just go update octopus object, send E0. It confirms because that's really what you should be doing. And it comes back and it says, there's the object with hello summit in it. And if I go around and update that, I can't remember whether this will actually show me or if I have to drill into it. But the one I updated, I think, was dev. And there, is, there it says hello summit. So really, really easy to do that. But it doesn't always work. And I am not above resorting to the browser um, developer tools to see what's being sent to the server. And the UI for this is, is again, quite nicely behaved, that it actually calls the same function calls as you would call, so you can get a snapshot of what's being called from the, the browser dev tools, and then use that in your code. So, just to round this off, one of the things, let's go back, one of the things that uh, comes up, I was talking about that big array of projects, so we want to change one part of 50 projects, and we can just say, okay, call get octopus project and uh, make sure you get the deployment process, and the deployment pro doing this, it actually puts in some extra links so that each each part has its appropriate context. When you go and change those, it actually changes the, 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 link, the, the objects that are bound to that deployment process that's returned. So this looks like it should create new objects, but it, it doesn't. PowerShell doesn't quite work that way. Right. I'll be out. Give me one minute. Okay. So we then use that update that we uh, that, that you saw before and the update is calling that same invoke octopus method if it's not handed json it converts the object it's given to a lump of json so quick summary then getting authenticated can be the biggest hurdle take care with the api keys once you've got it focus on the uh, user expectation not the api be power shelly and if you can uh, wrap all your calls into an invoke API method, that saves an awful lot of repetition. And the last bit, as I said before, reading is easier than um, deleting and, um, sorry, reading is easier than anything and adding and changing are the more difficult ones. And that's it. Thank you for your patience. Sorry for overrunning. <laughs> <laughs>